Looking to recharge your prayer life this year? Jesus Listens is a new 365-day prayer devotional from Sarah Young. Available now at JesusCalling.com slash Jesus Listens. Jesus is alive and he's at work yeah. in this world today in the middle of suburbia, you know, for us or the city, for people or, you know, wherever they are. And it uh, is mind blowing. Craig and I are, are brothers. I mean, we're more than the concept of brothers and, um, you know, we're family. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Have you ever been in a desperate situation wondering how you'll make it to the next day? Perhaps there isn't enough money to pay that one bill, or perhaps your health hasn't been the greatest, and you wonder if you'll ever feel better. Or maybe you're in a dire situation and you just can't see your way out of it. During these times, one person's kind gesture or offer of help is sometimes the way we're able to make it to the next day, turning a corner away from the turbulent season of our lives. So often these angels appear in the form of friends, family, and sometimes even strangers who act as God's agents to lift us up into a better place. This week, we'll hear two touching stories that speak to how God sends us help through others, right when we need it most. We're talking with singer Walker Hayes and his friend, pastor Craig Allen Cooper and founder of the Be Heard movement, Evan Duguid. Let's start with Walker and Craig's story. Hey, Walker Hayes, friends with Craig Cooper and a singer-songwriter in Nashville. And I have a wife and six kids and two dogs and two gerbils. Ooh, got the gerbils in. I'm Craig Cooper and best buds with Walker. I've been in pastoral ministry for 17 years, full-time and bivocationally. I helped plant and found Redeeming Grace Church in Franklin, Tennessee. I grew up in East Tennessee in Chattanooga, um, a place called Udawa, you know, right outside of Chattanooga, and I had a really great childhood. I grew up going to church, you know, every Sunday morning, Sunday night, every Wednesday night, but I didn't know the Lord. And so it was more for religion, you know, than it was a relationship with Jesus. And when I went to school at the University of Tennessee is when I heard the gospel, came to faith in Christ, and my life was forever changed. I grew up in Mobile, um, married my high school sweetheart, Lenny. We met in 11th grade. I am the last of nine kids. I actually grew up in the church, but didn't like it, you know, just went the other direction. Couldn't wait to kind of get out of that. My my dad was an ex-music minister, and we were at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I was ready to get out the house and get out of that, that church quickly. But uh, yeah, I played sports a lot growing up. As soon as I met Lanny, I always knew we wanted a big family, and moved to Nashville right out of college. Our move to Nashville was on a crazy whim. I mean, every time I tell the story, I'm, I'm still like, man, we were crazy because <laughs> I just showed no promise. I wasn't that talented. I didn't sing that great. And I had a, a small gig. It was just a gig that really changed my life. My dad got me a gig in Mobile and I was reluctant to play it. Finally, just played the gig and it did. It just changed, it felt so good. So I called Lainey and she was gung-ho. She was very excited. She, I said, you wanna to move to Nashville? I'd love to be a singer. That's and she amazing. said, yeah, she absolutely, didn't even hesitate, just said, of course. You know, it didn't make sense. Like I said, every time I tell the story, it's not practical at all that we moved to Nashville. Financially, we were doing pretty dismal. You know, we had one dying car and then we had a van that was about to get basically repossessed. I had an endorsement deal with a dealership and it was based on the fact that I was signed by a record label. I lost that record deal and then I kept it a secret from the dealership as long as I could because I knew they would take the van and I knew we had no options. If they took the van, I didn't know how we were gonna get anything. I couldn't afford to fix our Honda. So um, that was tough. I was an alcoholic at the time. Also, you know, I had just been beat up by Nashville and just wasn't really excited to be known or know people 
I just was not a very approachable person when I met Craig at all. And uh, a lot of that was by choice and just that was kind of comfortably where I lived. What happened is Laura, my wife, invited Laney and their family to go to church. And she said, sure. And, uh, you know, people will say that sometimes like, yeah, I'll, I'll come. And you don't know if they're going to come or not. We had planted a church, probably less than 30 people there, but they showed up. And so that's when we really met and uh, they walked in and I was just like, wow, you came. And, and uh, Walt says the first thing I said to him was glad you're here. We got to the point where we were just doing everything together, honestly, on a weekly basis. You know, we would be together numerous times, either in our home, you know, for dinner or in their home for dinner. We were celebrating kids' birthdays. We were celebrating our birthdays together, stuff like that, holidays. And, you know, we would, I mean, Walker and I would run the scoreboard for my son Joshua's baseball games. And that was a blast. And we would cheer for him and we would talk about life and everything. So we were really intimately aware of what was going on in their world. So we knew when their band got repossessed and, you know, Walker would say stuff like, ah, dude, we're good. You know, like, you know, we're, we're good. We got it. And it'll work out stuff like that. But, you know, Lara and I, whenever we would travel, go visit Lara's family or whatnot, they were up in the Northeast and we would let them borrow our van. And so we knew it helped. You could tell that was helpful. And then when we came back, I was always going, dang, I hate to take it back. You know what I mean? And so I started praying, Lord, please provide so that we can give them the van. And I talked to Lara and said, I think we need to give them that van. She agreed, you know, thinking the same thing. And I was working in a job that, you know, had some commissions and whatnot. And I closed the deal and we had enough to be able to go and replace our vehicle with a used vehicle around the area. And at that point, that night was when I was like, all right, let's clean the van up. Let's get it all set. And then let's just go make it where they can't say no. I'll have the title with me. I'll have already signed it. I don't know how Walker's going to respond to this. Ah. But we we drove two different vehicles to the baseball park. And we were there under the stadium lights at night, you know, at the end of the game. And they walked out and he's like, dude, what are you doing here? You realized, you know, what was going on. And I just you know, had the title and said, hey man, all you gotta do is sign this and it's yours. And honestly, we had a bit of a moment, you know, it was a oh yeah, a, kind of an altercation for a second. Um, and, you know, Walker's like, no way, man, I don't want to do that. And I remember Leela yelling, dad, just take the car. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then they did it. And um, I wasn't thinking anything other than, you know, we love them and this will help. That was it. But looking back, we saw so much significance Mm -hmm. in what God was doing during that time. You know, I see the significance of the gospel of grace. It's not something you earn. All you got to do is sign and it's yours. And Mm -hmm. he's done everything. We can't afford it. We can't pay for it or whatever. And we, we look back on stuff now and go, man, what was the Lord doing there? The gift Craig gave me in that van is so much bigger than a, just the actual vehicle, but it it confused me. You know, it was it was a frustrating night for me because in a way, I'm an atheist. He's a believer. The believer comes through with the help. You know, he saves the day. And I was probably a little mad. Like, mm. I don't need that you know i don't need whatever you have you know i'm good and i was embarrassed to accept the vehicle because i I felt like accepting a handout accepting help confess to the world i needed it you know if i didn't need it i I wouldn't take it and so it was really hard for me to accept the vehicle vehicle almost to the point where i didn't i just drove home with it i I think (laughs) i still in my mind was like, I'm going to give it back or I don't need, you know what I mean? I, I, I drove home with that attitude. But as I drove home with the burden, the relief 
the relief off my shoulders, the void filled with the car, I began to recognize like, man, I did need it. You know, wow, all my kids all have a seatbelt. I'm I'm a dad. Shouldn't that be a concern of mine? That's crazy. Craig, you know, supplied that. But I'm like, I don't know about church, but I get this guy, you know, he's got he's got something in him that I want. We were five years into the church plant and I was really discouraged because I had taken a ministry retreat the weekend before and I came back for various reasons from that retreat, just really doubting my own calling and whether or not anything that I was doing was making a difference in people's lives. And honestly, I was just really discouraged you know, five years into the plant. And so I took a walk in downtown Franklin, walking down Main Street, up back 11th and down Fair Street. And I stopped in the middle of that walk and I just poured my heart out to God. And I said, Lord, you know, I try to encourage other people. You know that I need you, please, to encourage me. Is anything I'm doing making a difference in anybody's life? Please show me that you have me where you want me. I had emailed the team, the leadership team of the church saying, I'm not sure I'm in the right spot, you know? And that night, Laura and I went on a date and I was just telling her how discouraged I was. And her phone buzz, she's sitting, you know, in the passenger side, I'm right here, her phone buzzes. And I was a little irritated that she looked down at her phone and I'm like, who is that? And she says, it's Lainey. So Walker's wife. And I'm like, oh, can you tell Lane, you know, that you'll talk to her later? And um, she's like, well, it's got an MP3 on it, which like had a song. We were accustomed to receiving MP3s from Walker. I love everything he's written and we just love to hear anything new he's working on. But this one had my name on it. And Laura said, it's, it's got your name on it. I think we need to play it. And I was like, ah, oh, let's just do that later. And she said, no, I think, I think this might help. And she persisted and that's when she played the song through the stereo speakers. So, yeah, I know, it sounds cool, right? Not your typical kid from Sunday school, right? I still ain't figured out church yet. But Craig, I get. I was just absolutely undone. And I lost it. And uh, just a puddle of tears. I couldn't talk. And I sat there stunned. You know, overwhelmed. Speechless. And I just said, I was speechless. <laughs> At that moment, I felt like God was singing over me through my unbelieving friend, <laughs> Walker. And I was going, and I had this peace that the Lord was, was saying, I've got you right where I want you. And to me, that's just a Holy Spirit thing. Like, I didn't know, I had no idea what Craig what his discouragements were. You know, I think he was a little hesitant. Like, here I am, a non-believer. The last thing he wants to do is be like, hey, like, church is getting me down, too. You know, he it's not, I didn't know those things. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that literally the song was like a grand slam for God <laughs> to was. speak to Craig, which is wild. Isn't that wild to think? A non-believer just dumping my heart out, honestly, knowing nothing about Scripture or anything and it meeting you in a place that's just nuts you know looking back as i wrote the song i'm just trying to thank craig but i can hear me in the lyrics now and with what we know now about our friendship and where it would ultimately lead and where it's going is um i was confused you know i was going look man i was like hey world i don't believe in jesus Mm -hmm. but there's this guy who does and the love radiating from his heart is, is it's perplexing me. And the song was really my heart. You know, I think the world tells us cope other ways, you know, go isolate, hide up in yourself. Don't let anyone know. Don't show weakness, that type of thing. And now 
I'm a little more, especially with Craig, it's, it's like you said in your post the other day, the to be known and loved. I mean, that's to really be known. That's what Jesus, Jesus already knows you. Mm-hmm. We just don't accept his love all the time, but he knows. And, and that's kind of how I feel. Oh, Craig, Craig knows and he loves and no matter what, you know, it's a, it's a great thing. And um, I think God was kind to show me Christ in another human. And um, I'm so grateful for that. You can find Walker and Craig's book, Glad You're Here, at your favorite retailer. Stay tuned for Evan Duguid's story after a brief message. You're going to love our newest series on the Jesus Calling YouTube page called Jesus Listens, Stories of Prayer. Hosted by singer Susie McIntyre Eaton, the YouTube series includes interviews with people from all walks of life, sharing their touching stories of how prayer made a powerful difference. Watch inspiring stories from author and creator of The Simplified Planner, Emily Lay, entrepreneur Stephen Miller, and author and influencer Kim Douglas, plus many more. New videos will debut each month. So subscribe today at youtube.com slash Jesus Calling Book so you don't miss an episode. Our next guest is Evan Duguid, founder and president of the Be Heard Movement, a nonprofit organization that provides mobile drop-in centers with laundry, showers, haircuts, case management, and resources for those experiencing homelessness. Evan shares a little bit of his own story and how the Be Heard movement came to be and how he looks at the work he does today as a combination of soul work and social work. So my name is Evan Duguid and I'm a founder and president of a nonprofit called Be Heard here in Tulsa in Oklahoma City. And we help those experiencing homelessness with our mobile drop-in center. We love to get to love on our neighbors and those in need here in our community. So here in Tulsa, there is an abundance of faith-based organizations, abundance of churches. And what we notice is that typically people focus on the soul work aspect, which is definitely needed, or only on the social work aspect of resources, mental health, and things like that. And, And we believe that both go hand in hand, right? We need the soul work. We need social work together to make an effective change in this community. And so we love getting to cultivate needs of, of spiritual needs. Uh, we love praying for people. We love seeing lives transformed and like in, in heaven benefited, right? But we also love people getting house, people getting, you know, case management services, people getting therapy. And so they both go hand in hand. That's that's the vision, that's the goal is to do both. And I feel like doing both is going to help, help solve a problem here in Tulsa. Growing up, there was definitely some trauma, some tough situations. I grew up in a in a house where we loved like Christmases, we loved birthdays, we were huge on family. And then when I was around 14, 15, that all got stripped away from me through divorce. My dad ended up leaving the house. My mom, she ended up leaving as well. To this day, I didn't know where she went. And I was at home, like alone, just taking public transportation everywhere to the to the gym and just going through a really rough time as a 15-year-old, you know, trying to survive. Lunch at school was always a problem and I went to a, a private school for basketball and the teachers started to notice what was going on and they allowed me to sleep in their classrooms to catch up on some sleep. They allowed me to do homework in their classrooms. They gave me extra like support. And during that time, like my cousin was shot and murdered when I was 16, my uncle died and I didn't have a bed throughout most of the high school. I slept on the floor. I ended up moving with my grandma. It was a three bedroom house with five of us. And so I slept on the floor. It was just very, very tough to, you know, one, try to focus on school when you're you're trying to focus on surviving. And it was hard to focus. But my teachers, I believe to this day, they saved my life. They are a godsend. And so my teachers allowed me just to be myself. They allowed me to cry. They They prayed for me. They loved on me. But most importantly, they listened to me. As a 15 year old, you know, you feel like you know everything. Right. And so. When people who are older don't listen to you or try to blitter your voice, that can really like, like cause you to spiral and just cause you just not just value your own voice or self. And I lived them for a little bit, but because they listened to me first, I believe like that, that saved my life by listening to me, helping me out, supporting me. 
that really saved my life. And so with that, I wanted to kind of present that to those experiencing homelessness, right? So by listening to them, listening to their stories, you know, elevating their voice, I believe that because it saved me, it can help save, you know, thousands of other people. And I'm, I'm standing here today only as a walking miracle, but most importantly, like God saved me and I want to, you know, help and go and do the same for somebody else. It was never, ever in any of my plans to come to Oklahoma. My dad left after the divorce, moved to Tulsa, and moved in with my sister. And I was real, um, just kind of just upset and struggling as a young man. And so I ended up playing basketball in Pennsylvania. And I was really just kind of going through it, making some wrong decisions. And so I ended up like leaving college and I was working three full-time jobs and I, I just couldn't do it no more. And then my sister called me and said, hey, um, your dad's actually like in the hospital. Like he might die. You know, he's sick. And so that kind of shook me. I was like, you know what? I'll come to Oklahoma for like three months to make sure he's OK. Check on him. And so I ended up moving to Oklahoma in 2018. And when I moved there, my dad ended up getting better. Right. But then I got a job working at Youth Services of Tulsa. They have homeless youth. And while working there, something just pulled on my heart just to help. And so a lot of them told us, hey, like we feel overlooked. Nobody's, you know, hearing our story. Nobody really cares about us. Kind of how I felt, you know, when I was 15. And so I told them, hey, I got this broken camera. I can record your story. And they said, "Okay, cool, let's do it. And so we went under a bridge and called it Bridge Talk. But my camera was so bad. The audio was so trash that you couldn't hear what they were saying. And so we ended up taking this camera, going back to their, you know, homeless encampment. And we start recording their story. And it was just a phenomenal move of God. And then I said, okay, what should we call this? And they said, let's call it um, Unseen or Be Heard. And I said, ooh, I love Be Heard. And so that's how our nonprofit name came about was through the voices of those experiencing homelessness youth. It kind of gets me every time, like, what if I didn't move to Tulsa? There's people on the street that I would never met who may have died on the street. Right. If I didn't move, if God didn't use my story, if if God didn't redirect my steps. Right. And so at the time going through it, I mean, it did not seem like that. I was very upset at God. But looking back, it's like, God, thank you that you saw an answer to a problem through me. So because like we said yes to God, God is literally changing the community of Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And there's people getting housed, people getting, you know, dental services, people getting showers. The only because of God's yes in God's hands. So we're very thankful that we get to do this. And it's just been a powerful, powerful story, not just for me, but for those on the street. And so they're very thankful as well. So when I was helping the youth who were experiencing homelessness, one of their top needs was a shower, right? But I only knew that because we listened first, right? A lot of times if you assume the need, your assumption blocks the real need, right? So if I assumed, oh, they just need like therapy, they just need some other help, like, like no, like I just need a shower right now. And so by the fact that we listened first, we knew what to pray for, but we knew what to go after, right? And so we ended up doing some research on how can we bring showers to Tulsa and come to find out they had these mobile shower trailers. I said, okay, cool. Let's, let's try to get one. So we, we wrote the vision down, made it plain, and we prayed to God for a mobile shower trailer. And when I say we, it's me and those experiencing homelessness. And so December of 2020, we were at Transformation Church in Tulsa, and they brought us up on stage. And Pastor Mike was like, hey, um, be heard, y'all getting a mobile shower trailer. And I, I was crying, right? And so like we just prayed for one four months ago, and now we're getting one <laughs> December of 2020. And I was crying, not because I got something, but because people who are praying and fasting for a shower get to experience the shower for the first time. In Tulsa, people haven't showered up to three weeks, some up to three months. Me, I shower every day because, <laughs> you know, uh, it, I feel good. But people were just not showering, which hurts their mental health. It just, you know, causes depression I mean, honestly, like if you haven't showered in a week, it just it hurts you, right? You, you just feel like nobody touched me, you know, nobody smelled me, you know, it can really hurt your self-esteem. So the fact that God provided a mobile shower trailer in four months, that was huge. And so 
The shower trailer was set to be delivered of July 31st of 2021, right? However, we had no truck to pull it. I said, God, I know you won't just provide a shower trailer, but now we got nothing to pull it, right? So we prayed for a, a truck. We tried to fundraise all we could. We raised like $10,000, but that could not buy a truck, especially during COVID. So I traded my car and we got a truck and I owed 30 grand on it. Our first payment was August 1st, right? And I get a phone call from a church called World Outreach Church. They said, hey, can you come to service on Sunday? I said, sweet, yeah. They brought me up on stage and paid off, before our first payment, our truck. And once again, I'm crying again on stage. I'm like, man, like God, this is so awesome. So I stopped putting God in a box of how he will provide for us. And so our very first shower was July 31st. And it was such an impactful moment. Like we did over like 40 showers that day. Um, it was just me by myself with some crazy volunteers just wanting to help people. And it was, it was so phenomenal. And so a month later, we get a call from TC saying, hey, we want to give y'all $100,000 for the next three years. And that was incredible because we took some of that money and bought the bus. And now we have a mobile shower trailer, a mobile laundry trailer, now a mobile mobile uh, barbershop bus. And I'm like, wow, this is incredible. Less than a year. It, look what God has done. Like this could only be God. I learned that trust is gained in buckets, but lost in, in drops. By us being consistent, by us being a man of our word, by us just showing up, it created a unique trusting relationship to those who are unhoused, right? So if I'm unhoused, I don't trust nobody. People are trying to steal my stuff. People are trying to tell me what to do. But if I'm being consistent and I'm, I'm there not to judge, I have my arms open and I just want to help them. And after a while, they see the consistency that creates a trust relationship. You know, with my teachers, you know, by them asking me how I'm doing, by them being consistent, it created a safe place for me to, to vent to, to me to cry to, to me to laugh to. And that really like helped me out in life. One of the most powerful things you can provide somebody is your ears, right? So by listening, by affirming to them, by allowing their voices to be heard, by allowing their testimony to be heard, that really is breaking barriers, but also creating a solution of trust. And so trust is key, right? One thing I know is people, when people on the street, they're homeless, they struggle with the calling of God on their life. And the fact that like we have this book called Jesus Calling, it's almost like funny, but it's like, God sees you. He has a calling for you, even though you're sleeping on a bridge. But God sees you. He loves you. And he's doing that through, through that book. Actually, what's crazy is when I was 15, my teacher would read one every day. She would always take out this book and read it. And a lot of us didn't know like why she would do it. It was a good transition for me to focus throughout my day. But also like little words that I would remember like, oh my gosh, like Jesus loves me. Like he actually is there for me. Through the, through the light, through the dark, like he's there for me, he's present. It's just been a very, very cool, like how in my need, in my trauma, like Jesus Calling book was there to help me as well, to start my day off and things like that. And then now we hand out to people on our caseload, Jesus Calling devotionals. And it's been so cool to see the fruit that comes from that, those gems she's dropping. It planted seeds, right? It planted seeds in my heart, in my mind, when I'm going through all this hard trauma, Look at the fruit now. Like now we're doing the same thing for other people, and now it's helping thousands of people. Jesus listens December 27th. In the name of Jesus, help me find joy in the midst of brokenness. One of the hardest times for me to be joyful is when I'm dealing with multiple problems, seeking solutions but finding none, and then suddenly I'm faced with a new problem. I found that if I focus too much on searching for solutions, I start to shift or sink under the weight of all my difficulties. Please remind me at such times that you are present with me in the midst of my various trials. I need to trust that you are at work in my situation and you are able to bring good out of evil. Your matchless wisdom and sovereign strength enable you to outsmart evil with good. In Jesus' name, amen. To learn more about Evan Do Good and Be Heard, visit BeHeardMovement.com. If you'd like to hear more stories about maintaining faith during times of hardship, 
check out our interview with Crispin Mayfield. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we'll hear from Jeff Henderson, a member of John Maxwell's Leadership Thought Leaders, and a professional who built a marketing career working for Chick-fil-A, the Atlanta Braves, and other notable organizations. Jeff shares how he finds purpose and personal meaning in his life and career, and how he leaned on his faith through the highs and the lows. You don't know what door God will open up if you're faithful in the small things. So be faithful in the small things. Be faithful where you are because God's paying attention. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com Jesus Calling Book on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page. Jesus Calling Instagram page. 